Okay. Well, we're going to sort of continue in some sense from the last part of the last talk, uh, talking about, uh, tra about transcription and DNA supercoiling. Uh, I want to thank the uh, committee for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, now, uh, the work I'll describe just to cover the um, uh, people who have done the work are uh, Sumitava, who is actually here, who is my student and uh, now is postdoc at Yale, uh, another student, and another postdoc, sorry, and Jose from Rice. And the work originally started with a student already some number of years ago, Stuart Sevier, uh, when we got interested in the, just the whole issue of how supercoiling might affect bursting. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I probably don't need to describe any more what supercoiling is, given that we've had numbers of lectures that have discussed this. I want to maybe just make a couple of, of simple points. Uh, when you talk about supercoiling, of course, initially you're talking about twisting the DNA, and that can happen in a number of ways. Of course, for the purpose of this talk and what was discussed in the last talk was twisting because of their transcriptional process. But the DNA has a mechanical life of its own. If you twist the DNA, and if you twist it enough, it might buckle. And when it buckles, it can go from uh, something that looks like a, a ring where you have all these uh, wrapped around here. If you try to o supercoil it, then it can go into structures which are now uh, regions of space where the entire DNA wraps around itself. These are usually called plectinemes, and that's another topological number which characterized the winding of that entire DNA around itself, which is called writhe. And in general, there's a topological constraint that says that the uh, linking number, how many times one strand wraps around the other, is given by a combination of twisting, which is where you just keep the entire DNA axis flat and you just wrap, versus writhe where the DNA axis itself is going around. And you can see different configurations uh, between twist and writhe. And the idea is that as you various biological processes act on DNA, in particular transcription, but also others as we've seen, uh, you will induce twisting, that twisting might be converted into other structures such as plectinemes and also into structures which you see on the bottom here, which is something like a melted piece of the DNA. Now, DNA is, has its own mechanics, so when you impose these extra twists or these extra linking numbers on DNA via these various biological processes, the DNA responds by generating a torque that tries to oppose you from doing that. And uh, over the years, especially in sort of the work of John Marco and collaborators, there's been sort of very nice work on trying to characterize in a general sense what that torque looks like. So there's a linear regime, which is what you get for any normal material, a linear response. If you twist it, then it provides a linear a torque to try to twist itself back. But then you get these other regions here. This is characteristic of plectinemes, where the DNA is uh, not really changing its torque over some range because it's folding into this plectinem structure. And then on the other side, you can get this melted DNA. Melted DNA is sometimes accompanied by R loops. That's a whole separate story, which we're not going to talk about today. But we can generally understand how, as you impose additional linking on the DNA, it will respond with a torque given by something like this function. Now, what we already heard, and what's been known for a long time, usually sometimes, well, sometimes called the twin domain model, is that RNA polymerase can inject extra linking numbers into the DNA. And the reason is very simple. The RNA polymerase, uh, if it's not going to do that, if the DNA is going to be rigid, for example, as seen in this sort of roller coaster moving on the track, if the track is rigid, the car has no choice but to go around in a circle. Now, RNA polymerase, when it's made, starts trailing behind it a long tail of made molecule. Uh, in bacteria especially, that molecule gets already decorated with ribosomes even as it's being transcribed further. So you have this very long, bulky tail, makes it very, very hard for that RNA polymerase to rotate. And instead, there's enough flexibility in the DNA that the RNA polymerase essentially stops rotating and instead starts twisting the DNA. And so we developed uh, a simple you know, mechanical model for how you determine uh, which one will happen, which, you know, what will be the balance 
as RNA polymerase moves along in an elongation phase, what will be the balance between it itself rotating, and that depends on how big and, the, and bulky and even the shape of that trailing edge of the RNA polymerase versus the DNA flexibility, and one can write down an equation that relates all those things together. I'm not going to describe it in gory detail. Uh, this is published uh, so you can look it up. But essentially, there are two angles, one determined by the RNA rotation, RNA polymerase rotation, one determined by the DNA twist, and this equation de is determined by the torques that are generated by that twisting, and you can write down a balance equation. Now, if you want to then create a co complete model for how motion affects these things, you need to add two things to this equation. You need to add, first of all, formulas for those torques, which I already showed you schematically what those formulas look like. You also need to develop a formula for how the RNA polymerase velocity depends on the torque, and that was actually studied in papers by, for example, Michelle Wong using single molecule experiments, and we developed a sort of phenomenological fit to those experiments that we then use in these models. Now, one of the papers that uh, in the bacterial world that really showed that these effects could be quite important uh, came out in 2019 from the group of uh, Christine Jacobs Wagner and, and they again looked at sort of single molecules and they in fact noted several particular experimental results that could occur because uh, of this supercoiling induction by RNA polymerase. And the, ex and the particular things they were interested in is not necessarily the effects on one RNA polymerase. You can imagine that if you have a single isolated polymerase moving along, the only effect is that it's going to slow down as it proceeds along elongation as it induces more and more twist into the system and generates positive supercoiling ahead of it and negative supercoiling behind it. But what they noticed is that if you looked at gene that were transcribed with more active promoters, you could have cooperative effects between different RNAs. Initially, for example, on the same gene, and the cooperative effect was very simple. It's if you have promoters that are moving, promoters that are generating RNA polymerases rapidly enough that you're getting sort of many RNA polymerases moving together, then the supercoiling between them is sort of canceling out. That there's negative supercoiling, let's say, behind the first RNA polymerase, canceling out against positive supercoiling being generated ahead of the second one. That reduces the torque, and that actually speeds up the process. So what they noticed is that as a function of the activity of, activity of the promoter, you could get cooperative speed up of transcription. And similarly, uh, they also investigated you know, what, what might happen for separate genes. We already saw examples of that. Separate genes have similar processes even before you start worrying about additional features such as whether supercoiling affects the binding of transcription factors or even the binding of RNA polymerase in the first place. Even before that, there's a basic effect of if you have genes that are being transcribed that way, you know, opposing directions, then you're building up more supercoiling, either negative supercoiling when they're moving opposed to each other, positive supercoiling when they're moving into each other, as opposed to tandem genes where, again, you're getting this cancellation effect, which in general, aside from these other factors which can make a difference, but in general for tandem genes you would expect, therefore, a speed up, a cooperative uh, relationship between transcription of those two genes. Now, uh, so our model explained, you know, was, was, was you know, eventually uh, was applied to try to explain that data in the bacterial experiments of Christine Jacobs Wagner, and here you can see various effects. Again, I'm not talking about the details. As a function of the strength of the promoter, you can see the speed up in the average velocity of elongation, average over these many, many different RNA polymerases, and then as a function of these different genetic configurations, you can see the difference between the expression of gene B if gene A is off versus gene A is on, and you can see this effect where genes in tandem uh, give rise to a positive cooperative effect. The, the blue is to the right of the red, and genes, either divergent or convergent, give rise to a negative interaction between the two, where you see that the blue is to the left of the red in terms of the effect that the, that the uh, calculations present. And this, uh, I mean, that experimental paper, in some sense, led to a mini boomlet in theoretical papers trying to explain and use the ideas of supercoiling. There was our paper published last year, and then there were also other groups 
uh, paper out of MIT, uh, papers out of Illinois, papers out of Johns Hopkins, uh, essentially trying to create some more quantitative version, the sort of what Peter suggested we needed uh, in the last talk, a more quantitative version of this idea that uh, I think we heard uh, very nicely expressed in the last uh, talk. Now, that is all for bacterial systems. Now, uh, and it's all published. The unpublished work that I wanted to describe is our attempts, uh, incomplete at the moment, to extend this to eukaryotic systems. And in eukaryotic systems, of course, there's one you know, new elephant in the room, an elephant that comes and goes in the idea of nucleosomes that are coming in and binding to the DNA. You're no longer propagating along uh, naked DNA. And so nucleosomes have a variety of effects. One effect is they might just directly retard the motion of polymerases. That's something which you would, should take into account. But a more indirect effect is that nucleosomes can soak up uh, uh, can soak up extra linking numbers because if you look at the configurations that we saw incredibly nicely in the crystal uh, uh, structure pictures in, in, in the first talk today, if you look at those pictures, you actually see that of course there's a wrapping of DNA around that, can, that gives rise to a writhe and sort of every nucleosome injects some amount of writhe into the DNA which then gets folded into the equation telling you how much twist you need to accommodate extra linking. And in fact, depending on if you believe that uh, there are different conformations of linking, open ones and closed ones that can, you know, nucleosomes can breathe back and forth between those two things, that will actually have an effect because those contributions, depending on the angles that the uh, linker DNA leave the nucleosome, can actually affect how much writhe is being generated. And so if you imagine that there are some dynamical conformation transformations going on among the nucleosomes, forgetting about also binding and unbinding, you have to sort of work out what the relative probability is of all those different events to fold into now a new relationship between torque and supercoiling. So that's being done uh, in a paper that's in preparation, mostly the work of uh, uh, Sumitaba Brahmachari, and uh, using a sort of free energy calculation to sort of weight those different configurations and also to include, and, and of course fit to various data that one uh, has in the literature on the torque uh, versus uh, um, you know, either naked DNA or DNA with uh, embellished by nucleosomes. Uh, so, and of course, that model not only goes with what happens with the fixed nucleosome positions and density, it also allows for the uh, deposition and removal of nucleosomes according to various rates that, for example, you know, although I've, apparently I learned it was controversial, uh, might be determined by, for example, different histone variants contributing to those different rates of uh, coming and going of those nucleosomes. So when you put that all together, you can do an analog calculation of what we did in the prokaryotic system. So here, just to remind you, this is what our sort of baseline curve for a single gene looks like in terms of velocity versus promoter activity with this large cooperative peak over here. And you can ask what happens if you try to do the same calculation now with these nucleosome embellished DNAs. And the answer is it depends very strongly on the rate of nucleosome turnover. At fast nucleosome turnover you get almost the same effect, maybe a little bit less. And at slow nucleosome turnover you get a very slow effect. And so the answer is, at least according to these preliminary results, that whether or not supercoiling will have a large effect at the single gene level, and equivalently you can work out the multi-gene case also, uh, will depend on parameters that are related to besides promoter activity and aside from other factors such as we heard that you know, genes can also express, you know, affect each other directly, uh, will also be affected by things like nucleosome turnover rate. And uh, I was very encouraged by the last talk because it's going to give me a lot of information to try to stew over to see whether our uh, uh, calculations are sort of in the right ballpark for explaining at least what's been observed in, in, in the yeast situation. Now, in my remaining five minutes, I want to talk about something even more speculative than our preliminary results on nucleosomes, which is a, uh, an, I, an application that came up due to a paper uh, that appeared about, I guess, two years ago at this point, a science paper with the uh, sort of a very... Uh, uh, interesting title, uh, especially for this uh, talk. It sort of combines various things that we've heard about. DNA repair pathways regulates transcriptional no noise to promote cell phase transitions. This is a paper that appeared in Science uh, by Lior Weinberger's group, and they argued that if you took uh, a certain treatment, it would induce, you know, 
apex, which is AP nuclei, endonuclease, involved in DNA repair, would induce the binding of that. You treat it with something which induces the activity of this DNA repair pathway. And they argued that if you did that, you saw a great increase in noise in gene expression. Now, as already mentioned in the last talk, uh, it's true that you know, our model was you know, then eventually used to explain this single gene data, single molecule data by Christine Jacobs Wagner, but it was originally actually developed to deal with, in fact, the idea that supercoiling can explain the transcriptional bursting, at least as seen in bacterial systems. This is a classic paper, I think uh, it was already referenced in the previous talk uh, from uh, Sunny Shi's group, showing that the uh, lack of having enough of a particular uh, topoisomerase, this case gyrase, was enough to, under the right conditions, depending on the geometry, give rise to supercoiling-induced bursting uh, in the bacterial expression system. So this was how our model was originally conceived when we started this work some number of years ago. So it was only natural for us to ask the question, could we use our model of supercoiling uh, to try to see whether that had something to do with the increased noise in this experiment that was that was uh, published two years ago. So uh, the increased noise, you know, I mean, I won't talk about their data. You can look it up. But essentially, uh, you know, here is before and after treatment. It was a pretty universal thing with different cell types, different genes. Sort of universally, genes became noisier. I mean, on, on, you know, on average, I mean, the, you know, there's always details. And our idea was really very simple. And it was motivated partially by their statement that it was true they were activating the DNA repair pathway, but their effect was actually not changed if they removed the endonuclease activity of the apex protein. So it wasn't the actual DNA repair or anything having to do with, you know, chopping off DNA that had something to do with this extra noise. So we assumed, we made the simplest possible assumption that it was just due to binding of some bulky protein to DNA, and this could act as a barrier to supercoiling diffusion, which in our model increases burstiness, increases the noise in the system. So we went through this and we did some calculations, and the answer is, again, tentatively yes. Tentatively, you can begin to match a lot of their data about the increase in noise if you assume the leading effect of their treatment is just to introduce more barriers to supercoiling uh, in, in, their, in their experimental system. This, again, remains to be tested. This is ongoing work, and uh, uh, the work on nucleosomes is, is in the process of being written up. This is not even in the process of being written up because we're still trying to figure out exactly how to test some aspects of this, but uh, especially because of the interest in DNA pair pathways, we basically want to put out the idea that that result has absolutely almost nothing to do with the fact that it was a DNA repair pathway that was being perturbed. Uh, so I'm done. Uh, what we've tried to do is to construct a, a mechanical model of how you uh, connect transcription and supercoiling. Uh, in, you know, we're pretty happy with the prokaryotic uh, version of this model because it can explain various things. It, of course, needs to include additional effects. Uh, you know, doing biophysical model of biological systems is a never-ending task because there's always more biology that you haven't captured. But nonetheless, I think we at least have a, ha, my, ourselves and other people who have done similar things have made progress on that task. Uh, extending it to the eukaryotic case is what is the sort of leading edge of the theory work. And hopefully we'll be able to do that and, and begin to compare uh, in more quantitative detail with uh, the experimental data that is now emerging, for example, as you saw in the last talk. And just as a side note, uh, we have at least a proposed mechanism for this paper in science uh, that uh, may or may not turn out to be uh, why you get increased noise in their particular treatment. Whether or not that has some biological significance and functionality, you have to read their paper and their argument to, to see if you believe them. But nonetheless, from a mechanistic point of view, we think we can at least understand what's going on. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. Be happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot. Um, I want to start with a question. Oh, okay. So, um, so yeah, you did sure. I'll get to that. Yeah, this is so, for us. Exactly. Um, so the, the turnover of nucleosome, is it coupled to transcription or not? Because we, we know that when the polymerase transcribes, yeah. it has to fix nucleosomes. And, and whether it reassembles it right after or if it leaves a gap which is filled later on, we have profound Yeah, so you're impact. saying, is it coupled to transcription in the sense that we allow, let's say, RNA polymerases to bump nucleosomes off the or off the DNA exactly. and things like that. Yeah. The answer is not so far. Okay. But again, that could easily be done in our model. Our model so far 
is literally just on and off rates of nucleosomes, not coupled to right. anything else. But, 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 you know, but we don't have to stick with that. There's no, sure. there's no re technical reason why we have to assume that. We just start out, we always try to start out with the simplest assumptions and see how far that carries right. us. And then, of course, we learn along the way what parts of the biology are thwarting our right. agreements. Because I think there's reason to believe yeah. that there can be different pathways of reassemblies yeah. with different delays, yes. which would actually be, yeah, be which pretty, could be important. important. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think as we begin to have real data to compare to, I think we will stop being able to learn those uh, nuances. So, uh, Andy. So well, you stole my question completely. <laughs> but um, but just maybe a s small follow-up point sure. that I'm curious about is that that probably should be asymmetric, right? Like it should affect the leading and the, the, the positive and negative differently. And so, in principle, yeah. you wouldn't get complete cancellation in that case. So there might be interesting effects depending upon the rates of the turnover and how they're affected differently in the positive and negative sense. Sure, no, yeah, as I think it's the same answer. In other yeah. words, I think, uh, the, yeah, I mean, I think we, our first question to ask ourselves was essentially, you know, under any circumstances, would we expect to see given that nucleosomes are having you know, very effects, and in particular that they're soaking up some of the supercoiling you know, as a general rule, would you still expect to see residual effects such as the type we see in E. coli? And the answer is under limited, within our simplest assumptions, under limited conditions, the answer is yes. And now the question then becomes, okay, let's go to some experimental system where we know, uh, where we can see when you get those effects, when you don't get effects. If I, if I paraphrase the previous speaker, at least in the yeast system that, that's being considered, uh, you see really significant effects if you artificially lower the amount of topoisomerase. We, we have topoisomerase also as a relaxation in our model. I didn't mention that, I probably should have. Uh, we obviously did that because we needed to match the bacterial data. Uh, uh, so once we convince ourselves that there could be effects under some circumstances, then the next question becomes, okay, can we work through what is really the right detailed model for a specific experimental system, and then the issue of what's actually causing nucleosomes to come and go, you know, how does that affect it by supercoiling, how is that affected by transcription, those are all things with, we, we, we're going to have to, it's on our list of long things to consider once we try to compare it to the real world. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks, that was nice. I, I, I have uh, something similar maybe to add to the list, so, or maybe you've already done this. My question was, have you, because nucleosomes are not equally spaced in vivo, right? There's usually actually yeah. depletion there's some, of nucleosomes. There's some, there's some variation, right, yeah. Yeah, and usually around promoter regions, especially at activated genes, the nucleosomes get evicted, which may actually then release some of yeah. these supercoils, which may help or decrease yeah. activation. I was wondering if you've looked into what the effect of the spacing of the nucleosomes may be. <laughs> so, so I'm going to have to give the same answer three yeah. times in a row. <laughs> so, so, uh, but I'll give the same answer three times in a row. It's okay. Uh, so, the, so the answer is uh, we would love to go through your paper in detail and see exactly you know, what additional details are important for, for yeah, and, and maybe either general or not general, which would be needed to explain specific experimental systems. Uh, while we were doing this work, I have to say, we didn't even know that, you, that this data was on, en route to, to, the, to public view. So I think, uh, as I said, we literally asked ourselves the question of, were there scenarios in simple models where supercoiling would make a difference in terms of the same things that have been seen in these, in these prokaryotic systems. Once we convinced ourselves the answer is yes, then we started looking for experimental data. Uh, the experimental data we were looking at were sort of some genome-wide studies of where supercoiling is and how it's localized, and we were not particularly happy with the, 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 uh, the, let's say, the close relationship between that data and how, and our predictions. But we wanted some single molecule data, and now apparently it's available, at least. So we will look in detail and, and get back to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, very beautiful talk. Um, can you just fill us in a little bit on the, on the background for this? If, um, if supercoiling and the, um, is, is, is so important for, for transcription, shouldn't, are there patterns um, uh, with respect to how different genes are oriented with one another in the genome, if if so, since then yeah. supercoiling, since this effect is apparently important, shouldn't there be some selection for 
a certain, that's, I don't know, strong genes should never be, you know, pointing towards one another or, or something yeah, like that's that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I don't think that's been studied. I mean, I don't, maybe somebody else knows if, if there's been a, a genome-wide study of, of that. I think that's been thought about more in the sort of synthetic biology context of how what people started noticing is if they started putting in genes in various random places, they got different answers. And they tried to figure out, well, what's the difference between, you know, something that's inserted here and inserted there, and they discovered there could be these, uh, these, these sort of cross-gene correlations. Uh, so that's anecdotal, but, but what people have, have argued, and, and uh, the idea that nucleosomes could be playing some difference was, you know, understood, and there's a, a qualitative version of that in, in, in one of the papers I cited, the paper by MIT group. Uh, but I don't know of anybody who's sort of, sort of looked from sort of what, what you would think of as sort of maybe an evolutionary genomics context, which is our genomes designed such that you avoid the sort of competition where you think you don't want it. And uh, I don't know if anybody knows if that's been looked at. Maybe someone else here knows that. Uh, maybe that person knows. I don't know. Maybe I can give a reference to an author that studied uh, this problem uh, in deep in the Strike coli, George Muskelishvili, that uh, shows that basically transcription is oriented in the Strike coli because you want to avoid the collision between replication and transcription. Yeah. And this, in his, uh, his hypothesis is that this makes a gradient to super coli in genome wide. Okay. Maybe it's true, I don't yeah, know. So, yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, there's, there's anecdotal pieces out there, but. Uh, I think we needed uh, to move to a more quantitative level, and I think we're, the community is now doing that. Okay, well, okay. thank you, and have a good lunch. Thanks again.